I worked. I worked quite a lot as, as a kid, you know. In my explorations, I also liked to work. Mm -hmm. So I started as a as a uh, shoe shine boy, maybe <laughs> we call it a shoemaker, but maybe better term is the shoe mender. Um, yes, yeah, shoe from, mender. From about age ten, and I'd walk maybe four or five kilometers to nearby villages and mend shoes for people, and to go to the Pito area and people take off their shoes and throw them at you and you wow. shine their shoes for them when they are drinking. I did all that for seven years. I went to secondary seven school. Seven years? Home four before I stopped being a shoe shine boy. And wow, so, so shoe shine boy to Virginia Tech professor. Yeah. All right, you are welcome to this episode. In this episode, we have an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, professional that we are going to attempt to pick his brain uh, a little bit if we can. And, and I promise you, we are going to do it. We're going to attempt to at least do it. His name is Professor Emmanuel Anoche Frempon. He is uh, a native of Ghana, but he is a professor at one of the uh, prestigious universities in America, none other than Virginia Tech. Uh, actually, I was doing a, a quick uh, look at Virginia Tech and uh, Prof, we, 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 we're going to, uh, uh, as I was doing a little bit of a uh, look around at Virginia Tech, I noticed that it's, I think, the top university in the state of Virginia. They call it the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know, I don't even know exactly i don't even know why that name commonwealth so maybe you might explain that to us if, if to because they are, they are british uh colonial affiliations ah yeah, okay had, had and still retain certain relationships with the british you know kentucky commonwealth, of ah. commonwealth of wow wow of yes wow i thought americans Disliked, not dislike. Americans didn't really want to associate themselves with anything United Kingdom, so that's why the United Kingdom spelled center C E N T R E. America spells C E N T E R. <laughs> they drive yeah, on the, they from the opposite sides. <laughs> certain things uh, they, they they retained. Okay, and they and they call the the United States called football soccer. <laughs> so. That's right, and it's very unique because there is American football, you know. Football, yes. So it's actually handball, and, and it's actually <laughs> not football. <laughs> uh, so, Prof, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, amazing, amazing. So, as I was saying, uh, Prof is uh, is is he, and I'm gonna uh, let you uh, talk more about what you do, your discipline, and everything. But I noticed that Virginia Tech is is a huge school. Um, no, I noticed that they're, they're almost close to 40,000 students that they, 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 the university has, which is massive. Um, so, Prof, you are most welcome again. And if you don't mind, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about who Prof is and uh, what you do at Virginia Tech? So, <laughs> the, the who I am... <laughs> um i was i was born in i was born and raised in Obuasi, uh, okay here yeah, the gold gold city <laughs> of ghana yes uh, grew up there um then went went to uh Obuasi secondary technical school mm. for my ordinary and ad advanced level uh secondary okay and then um ended up ended up at tech and and eventually to um to the United States for graduate study. So I'm sure we'll okay. revisit some of this okay. yes. life yes. journey. Yes. yes. But um, at Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. where I actually went as a postdoc originally after my PhD at Purdue University in Indiana. Oh, wow. Indiana. That's also a good school. Um, but... Yes, Purdue is <laughs> Purdue is Latin. It's just Latin yes. at Virginia Tech. Yes, yeah, it's a good, very, very good school. <laughs> Virginia Tech likes school. I have people from Purdue too. Amazing. So um over there I, I started as a postdoc and then postdoc is post postdoctoral fellow or postdoctoral research associate. Okay. Um usually a year or two after PhD. 
Okay. You actually get your 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 hands dirty doing uh, practice, research, publishing work, just supporting somebody else's research program. That's what post okay. do. Wow. Um, but providing a very competent support, you know, back up okay. for otherwise principal investigators who are really busy. Okay. Um, but at Virginia Tech, I um I was offered a faculty position somewhere along the line. Okay. So I transitioned to a faculty in 2007. I started over there in 2005. Okay. Uh, so in 2007, I became an assistant professor of uh, fisheries. Um, mm. Actually, my full my full title would be assist, uh, currently is a professor of fish ecology and conservation. Okay, um, wow. And those distinctions matter. Fisheries ecology, fish ecology, uh, all those things have their own differences. But broadly, um, I, I started there as, as a professor, as a professor, uh, a professor of fisheries uh, or fish ecology and conservation. I I teach, okay. I do research, and I advise advise graduate students. Okay. And these are some of the broad missions of the university, the three big missions of every university, especially public universities. Okay. It's teaching, then then research, and or, which we like to call discovery because that's okay. what research is supposed to do, is to discover new knowledge. And then um, engagement. Okay. Engagement with the with the with the public. So in those three roles, I, I typically teach my teach ecology classes, teach statistics classes because I have a master's degree in statistics as well. Wow. Um, statistics classes to fisheries and biology students. Hmm. Tell you wow. more about my research areas later. <laughs> and I advise yes. so, so no. really mm -hmm. one of my biggest. Yeah, advising students, grad, uh, graduate mm. students, masters and PhD okay. students. It's really okay. One of the most significant things. I, yes, you do. Wow, wow. So, no, no, what, what, what do we to the layman? What is uh, fish ecology? What, what, what to to us who don't know much about it, what what does it entail? At least I understand. I know what the fish is. I don't know the ecology bit. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go way back to high school or something, maybe even uh, uh, junior high. Okay. Um, a teacher, pilot, biology teacher, probably defined ecology as a study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. Yeah. Yes, I remember so now. Every animal has a habitat. Uh -huh. Every plant has a habitat. Okay. And within that, um, they have to live their lives. Their goal for an animal, their goal is to is to survive, to grow, mm -hmm. and to reproduce. Okay. To leave their kind behind before they die. You know. Okay. So when a fish wakes up in the, it wakes up in the morning, it has to find food. It has to eat. It has to um, it has to find mates. Uh, it has to make babies if it's mature. Yeah. Sure. Wow. These are every animal goes about it a different way. Um. And so, in order to really conserve biodiversity and keep these animals around for a variety of reasons, okay. for which you don't want to lose these animals, right? You have to understand how they live. Okay. And so, an ecologist seeks to understand how an animal or a plant lives its life cycle. And by fully understanding that, in my case, with fish, okay, I can tell you what not to do to the environment if you want the fish to be there. If you want mm. the fish to survive and, and live here for, for the long term. You can also take an understanding of the ecology of fish to apply to, for example, the husbandry of fish. Okay. Because, you know, just like crops, we do need to grow food. We didn't. We need to grow our animal food. Of course, we we do livestock farming. We farm goats and sheep and so forth. Chicken. Yes. Yes. Um, we farm corn and 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 
what not rice and everything but fish farming is a relatively new form of farming to many people especially mm -hmm. to us africans asians started fish farming long long time ago and so we domesticate fishes of different species just like domesticate farm animals and then we grow them and we grow them in large numbers so to to be able to do that with fish you have to understand their ecology yeah you can't take a fish that is supposed to live in 20 degrees celsius of water and put it in 10 degrees celsius water or 30 degrees celsius water and expect it to survive long enough so these are the kind of knowledge you need to know about animals in order to provide humane and husbandry environment for them if you are going to raise a lot of tilapia for people to eat wow that that is incredible that's incredible wow I, I i don't know my knowledge about fish and and and, and the aquatic animals are a little bit limited but the other day i was watching some news item and there uh, i noticed that there's a particular type of tuna that i think they were auctioning it off from japan or something like that it was like three million dollars i said what kind of fish and i said wow why is it that african countries don't have this type of fish to to also auction and, and make a ton of money i said wow this is this is ridiculous i mean that type of money and uh, somebody told me that that's a very special type of uh, of tuna that is served at the top hotels in the world and those kind of things. Uh, Doc, is that true? Are they specialized fishes of high quality, high nutrition is only specific areas uh, of the world? Or, or... Oh, absolutely. And, and sometimes it's not about nutrition. It's about, you know, cult cultural um, mm -hmm. anecdotes about how okay. special certain things are to eat or um, okay. how rare how rare it is to find oh. maybe that kind of fish i don't know about ghana um when i was a child i think there were such stories you know like when fishermen go fishing there may be one type of fish that when they find uh -huh. that is special they set aside and give it to their mother-in-law or something you know it's like <laughs> this one this is special special <laughs> so certain, certain species of fish have, have a very big social um uh, some kind of social attachment to them in a mm. way that especially in the rich cultures it can become such a, a an expensive rare and expensive thing to lay your hands on that it can enter into the world of auction for heavy prices. Um, wow. Unfortunately, many of these, if something is going for really high price, it's probably not grown on a farm. Somebody captured it okay. in a while. Okay. And a okay. lot of wild, wild captured fish that are rare, it is a problem to begin with if, if a species is really rare and is being hunted, you know because they do that practice drive species to extinction oh and wow once a species goes extinct you can't get it back many of the tuna species have have suffered that kind of fate you know bluefin tuna and some other mm. uh, yes. i never knew this wow that just that is amazing that's amazing and and also the conservation bit also you talks about i think you 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 hit on it i was just trying to divide the two to see if i could understand it better but i think you you probably even already answered the conservation uh, a bit uh, about i think the conservation has to do with making sure they are not ex extinct am i right in that in thinking yes. that way okay. yes so you know we have typically for fish, for some reason, we have relied so heavily on just harvesting fish from the wild. Okay. Unlike, you know, domestic um, animals that are now raised in, in significant quantities through um, livestock farming. Okay. We, we 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 don't have to go to the bush to go to get a, a an antelope or whatever every time we want to eat 
you know, we want to eat meat that's like yes. goat meat or sheep. Yes. But yes. but we have relied so heavily on harvesting from the wild, which is really a prehistoric practice, right? We yes. So we we have way pa- we've gone way past the stage where the pressure on wild fish resources is way exceeding the ability of those natural fish stocks to renew okay. themselves or to continue okay. to happen. Right. And harvesting over harvesting is one of several factors that lead to species extinctions. Okay. When a species goes extinct, not only is it not available anymore as food, biodiversity has a lot of other ways it serves us. Mm. You know, there are medicines and cosmetics and cultural values and all sorts of values associated with all kinds of species plants and animals. Yes. Okay. Wow. And so there is more reason to keep species around than just so they don't go extinct. And somebody mm. might say, goes extinct, then what? The, the fact that when a species goes extinct, that's it. It's taking millions and millions of years for species to evolve and diversify to have all the species we have around here. Right. It's not going to, that species is not going to return and a new species is not going to pop up in our lifetime. Wow. Um, so there is such a thing as rapid evolution and, and spe- uh, speciation and so forth, but these are things happening over geological timescales. So yes. Overfishing is one of the ways that we've driven species to extinction and need to reduce that by doing, for example, farming, farming instead okay. of relying heavily on, on wild, but also um, just the way we destroy habitat. Mm-hmm. You know, in Ghana, for example, one of our biggest problems has been the, the Galamse yes. onset of Galamse. The, yes, the yes, 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 yes. The removal of forests and streamside vegetation, riparian vegetation is what we call it. So all these large rivers and even headwaters that feed the large rivers are shutting down. They are silted completely with, with dirt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, earlier on I told you, you need to understand how a fish lives, how it reproduces. So you, so you know what not to do if you want that fish to be here for, for, for the long term. A lot of fishes need the substrate to be clean, to be rocky. Okay. Oh, wow. Put their eggs in the, in the gravel or rocky substrate, for example. So when you, when you, you wash a ton of clay into a stream through Galamse or whatever, you mess it that up. Happens completely covered and it's only a matter of time a year or two three five years and then they say the species that live there you don't find them anymore no more they they haven't moved anywhere they could not reproduce so they they are gone from there Hmm, that's this is serious that's called estipation you know local extinction and if the species doesn't have a very wide range when it goes extinct in one local area it's probably extinct everywhere forever well this is this is this is fascinating it's fascinating prof i i i i hope i hope most of these african authorities know about some of these things because it's 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 terrible i mean looking at how galamse and things have destroyed the the natural ecosystem around especially parts of ghana in the eastern region western region is 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 terrible you know i'm oh, from wow. a, and so, Mansun Kwanta area, my hometown mm. is Mansun Apunapun, which is which very close to Mansun Kwanta. It's one of the heavy hops of Galamse in the country. Wow. And, you know, they have pits everywhere that were dark for Galamse that are just left open and people are falling and dying in them. You know, oh, my um, goodness. A few years ago, and when I say a few, I'm talking about maybe eight to ten years ago. Okay. I... I started watching Google Google Earth maps of mm-hmm. the landscape uh, around southern Ghana. And 
you know, Google Earth is, is a free resource of maps of areas and how they are changing over time. You know, area photos taken by satellite and posted online. So you can, you can anybody can go take Google Earth and see what's somewhere in the landscape. Right. And what I noticed was a lot of the small rivers around here in, in the Ashanti region in particular, around the area that I just described, the Masu area, were intact with, with forest all around them. Then about three or four years ago, I looked at the Google Earth maps again, and the entire network of stream can be seen from way higher up with white mm. lines all over the map because the streams have been dredged and the riparian forests have been removed and all those streams have quickly changed from forested cool streams for, for fish and people too. Just what mm -hmm. other people, villages all over the place, they drink directly from these yes. streams. Now it's just dirty water, clay water all over with pits all around all these streams. My goodness. So, and it's not only a Ghanaian phenomenon. It's not, it's it's not everywhere. just here. Um, and we did some work in Cameroon recently and the story repeats itself everywhere. They have mining along their rivers. It's taking over some of the large rivers that are really significant for fisheries have been destroyed for mining for gold, yeah. Wow. So, so, Prof, do, would you would you um, say that, um, or what's the state of um, fish farming in, in in Africa per se? You know, if you use Ghana as an example, is is this something that uh, I could see that uh, I mean, I remember um, back in the in the days I used I had a lot of time, so I watched Discovery Channel a lot, and uh, there was one Discovery Channel that they were using this trawler to fish uh, in the, I think in the Arctic Sea or something like that. It was a, quite a fascinating uh, show. So it's like, wow. Then I got to know that that, that business is a multi-million dollar, probably multi-billion dollar um, industry. So I, I'm, I'm guessing in, in various parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the likes, are, are we really making the best out of that that? area of, of uh, business or that that area when it comes to commerce are, are we taking fishing seriously that could bring in as a, a you know source of employment uh, revenue for the tax authorities revenue for the government and also uh, revenue for everyday people uh, what, what are you seeing so that's the aspiration that's the aspiration of governments all over africa and that's the aspiration of the government of ghana mm. Um, but on the ground, you see that we could do better. Okay. We could do much better. So um, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, releases reports of fish production and aquaculture production. So when they say fish production, broadly applied, they are talking about okay. fish that is harvested from inland waters, from coastal um, and marine sources and then um, produced in fish farming. They release these statistics and put countries side by side so that you can see which countries are doing well and you know all that. And of course, um, globally, the, the capture of fish from the wild has leveled off, regardless of the amount of effort that is put in. Put in. They, we can't get any more fish than we are already getting from the ocean. Um, and that story also repeats itself when you go from country to country. So for example, Ghana, our production line has flattened, not only has it flattened for marine fisheries, for about the last 20 years, the capture from marine sources is actually declining. Declining, okay. Declining at about 2% a year from- Oh, wow. Year work that I did. Now, when you say 2% a year, it may seem like a small decline. Oh, but over 10 years is big. It compounds over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Add up to a significant yes. uh, reduction. So, um, of course, governments recognize this. FAO statistics, um, we report what we do to the FAO and FAO publish it. 
you know so we are aware of it before it's published that this is this is our performance and it's not great um a lot of fish production happens in asia through fish farming okay um, chinese alone produce about 15 percent of all farmed fish um to the world mm. so um i mean we are talking about a world of 200 plus countries one country produces 15 percent. 15 percent wow that's a lot yes that's a big and industry there's only just about 10 countries that produce um i produce 50 percent of all the fish that is going around wow so then the rest the rest are spread loosely everywhere yes <laughs> and Ghana has had a real, a real serious deficit of fish production and fish consumption ghana is a very heavily fish consuming country and we um, we, we i think we net import right yes because because we don't produce nearly enough to to meet the demand mm -hmm. so when you look at you look at the the trend you know at this point we probably um we, we eat about one million tons of fish a year mm -hmm. tons wow, in absolutely. this country and that's average to about some one uh, each individual eating about 25 to 30 kilograms of fish a year hey. that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> wow um, i mean that, that that's we are very fish uh, fish loving country in terms of eating them but our production from harvests from the rivers from ocean from fish farming is only about half of that hey. our 500 thousand tons so that that means that that means prof there's a massive room for entrepreneurs yes. and businesses to get involved exactly there is this huge deficit of production and consumption consumption is estimated but it is not done willy-nilly there is a very rigorous scientific process for doing those estimates and so mm -hmm. this gap between production and consumption lead to imports imports mm -hmm. of fish all sort of fish we used to import tilapia from china i don't know if they've stopped doing that but, you know we can grow tilapia here we used to import tilapia from china then of course the mackerels and other marine fish we import mm -hmm. them from europe you know that when you import things your currency suffers, <laughs> suffers. <laughs> yes so fish is one of those that um also dings our currency because we we import fish still import mm -hmm. a lot of fish so in 2012, the government actually released a document. It was called the Ghana Aquaculture Strategic Plan or something like that. That was supposed to increase aquaculture production heavily over a very short time so that this gap between local production and consumption will be closed. And unfortunately, very well sounding policy, but implementation was Fishes. not um, sport. Uh, I didn't match the enthusiasm with which the documents were produced. And we are more or less back where we, we started that's about so 10 sad. years ago. Yeah. And that's the conversation I'm having with my students right now. I'm doing a Fulbright program here. So I'm a teacher in, at the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Wow. In yeah, that, that that's that's why you're enjoying the Ghana breeze. That's why that's why you are you are nice and relaxing uh, in in the in the in the Ashanti region breeze. <laughs> amazing, amazing! Oh, wow, 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 wow! So, so, prof, it, it just if um. <laughs> Yes, you 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 you're actually basking in the nice breeze, national territory. So, um, if somebody wants to enter into um, the uh, fisheries, the aquaculture kind of uh, business, what do they need to do, or what 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 do, what are the things they need to consider? Because for me, as like most of our young people, 
uh, they struggle with finding jobs after college and all those kind of things. Um, so their drive to push, to help push some of them into some various types of entrepreneurship is, is, a, is a very laudable idea. So my audience always want to find out what can they do for themselves. And I see that this is a massive opportunity. So for people with that kind of interest, how do they start at all? So if you talk to an economist, mm -hmm. they will say that if you want to start a business, the first thing you have to consider is, is market, right? Okay, okay. Who, who is there that wants the product that you, are, you want to make? Mm -hmm. That's to buy it when it's produced. Okay. If you don't know who is going to buy it, don't start because okay. you, you go through the whole process to produce and then... And then Nobody and then buys. So... But of course, you and I would agree that there is a market for fish. Yes. We eat more fish than we produce in this country. So mm -hmm. if you make the right choice of species and the right location mm -hmm. to, to produce them, okay. you should have market. And it's, it's okay. priced really well. Okay. And so um, I think one of the big constraints for the youth trying to get into fish farming, just like any, any personal... Um, a private Endeavor. business is mm -hmm. capital, right? Yes, okay. And fish farming, if, if you want to do it well, you can, uh, it, it can run a significant amount of money. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, banks have, not been, banks have not been particularly supportive of, especially young people going into fish farming, looking for loans from banks. Mm -hmm. Um, fish farming is a risky is a risky business, just okay. like any kind of farming, right? It can be subject mm -hmm. to disease, storms, okay. wash away your cages or your whatever those things. So you have to prove to the bank that this is a profitable business through a really good yes. business proposal that spreads out all the sources of revenue and the costs to show that it's profitable. Okay. And a lot of a lot of the young people don't. You don't learn these things in school. Yes. You have to write a business, a business plan. It's true. It's true. So we have students taking a, a fisheries uh, or agriculture degree from the university who you cannot call on to, to write a business proposal for you to set up a fish farm. They've been trained to think that the government will employ them. Hmm. And therefore... They really don't do much in a way of preparing themselves and their lectures are not always helping to prepare mm. them to be mind, uh, entrepreneurial minded. minded so yes. they know how to do a business proposal. Mm -hmm. They know how to do the profit and uh, you know, they, they, they do profit and loss statements. all the different kinds of Scenarios. statements that go with a business proposal, enterprise okay. budgets, the cash flow, all those different things that show you how this business is going to do over the next 10 years. Say. Okay. And then when they even find somebody to do this for them, you realize that the training has also ignored a lot of hands-on practical <laughs> training. Hmm. So the person who is supposed to be the farmer themselves are often not as invested doing the work themselves. Uh, okay. They would rather hire somebody to do the work for them, but they don't want to get their hands dirty. Dirty. Hmm. So fish farming is farming. It is, fish absolutely. It's farming. And if you don't like farming, you are not going to like fish farming. And so the problem often starts from farming. We have an attitude that farming is for poor people. And, you know, you... you <laughs> You've been to the United States, you know that the rich people yes. are the farmers. The rich people are the farmers. The rich people. And, and over here, we have, uh, you know, it's opposite. Have, like, two, two types of farmers. <laughs> of course, there are some successful local farmers, so I shouldn't. I, yes. The categorization is. But on average. Yes. On the uh, average, you have poor farmers in the village who work very hard and make very little money. Yes. Then you have expatriates who are doing really well very well here so there are there are a few really large fish farms in ghana there's only one 
really remarkable local fish farm that I know. Um, mm. Flosel, Flosel Farm by okay. uh, um, oh, the owner is Evans Danso, mm -hmm. who actually has a recent Wadamaya production okay. uh, covering his farm and how he started and all that. It's oh, is it, a is it a gentleman from UK? Evans is Ghanaian. He's Ghan yeah, he's, he's Ghanaian, but there was one that Wadamaya did. That was a gentleman. He came from, he relo he Ghanaian relocated from UK. Uh, and 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 was doing amazing fish farm. Maybe that may be a different one. It could be another one. And and mm. I won't be, I won't be surprised if there are a few more, mm. you know, up and coming, successful fish farmers. In the last five years or so, my interaction with the local fishing uh, fish farming industry has been reduced because for the last two or three years, COVID and nobody. Yes. Knows. Yes. But also before then. Um, the project that I was leading, the USAID projects that I was leading, ran out of funding, and so we weren't really yes. able to keep as close a contact and an eye on, on look at on them. them. Okay, you know, so we to for somebody to go into fish farming business, they first have to have the mindset that farming is hard. Yes, farming you have to be invested in it yourself personally. Right, you have to understand that. If farming is hard, fish farming is even harder because you're mm. rearing animals that you don't see. It's you true. put them in the water and they disappear, right? They are under the water, whether in a pond or in a cage, but you don't really see them much. And so when you throw feed in there, sometimes whether they are eating it or not, you are not sure. You don't know. Feed is extremely expensive. Mm. And if you don't have the right numbers of fish in there and you're putting all the feed in there the feed is just going waste you will not make profit wow so you have to learn, you have to come in with quality knowledge you yes. have to learn how to do fish farming and acquire the knowledge necessary to get started so if somebody wants to go in the fish farming business my my advice is a mindset mm. they know that they are going into farming and farming is it's dirty work. You make money, but you also make yourself really um, apply yourself to to dirty work. Yes. And then, um, you know, you have to understand business, business, mm. pra business practices. practices. You, have to, yeah. you have to know how to project profits and, and, and losses. You have to know when you are losing money and you have to acquire the proper knowledge through consulting with you know, people who know how to do it. You don't need yes, exactly that it. And there are a lot of good consultants around the country, including mm. successful fish farmers. Wow. Who you can talk to to get an idea where to start. <laughs> and, and us, wow. you know, all of us. Right yes, I was, good, I was going to say I'm prof as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I've worked for the government in the past, consultant for, for the government. Right. I've worked with the universities, mm -hmm. and our message is quite consistent from place to place, and and also encountered individuals, and I say the same thing. You know, this fish farming can be a very very profitable lucrative business in Ghana, mm -hmm. and we need we need more of those the young people to get in involved. In yes, but they have to come in with that mindset that they are farming. Exactly. And farming is is not tie and suit. It's true. It's true. Farming is, you know, for a few years you really drive tractors. Mm. You might drive a uh, uh, an abobo ya or Kia to town. Yes. That's okay. Who, who cares? You're making you're making money. You're a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. No, uh, probably thinking about that I, I i just i'm thinking that even even for the um the young person who may not have the capital right now to jump in head on they could even sit down and and look at the entire value chain of of of, of fish farm be, be, be from the the farm itself to the marketplace any of the value chains in there and then plug themselves in because I, I would think that even if such value chain exists, it, it may be inefficient. It may be crying for uh, somebody to step in to make it more efficient. So uh, I don't know what you think about that. Exactly. And there are a lot of papers published. Oh, wow. There are a lot of papers 
published about the fish uh, farming, the fish value chain of Ghana. Mm. And there are, as you are saying, very clearly identified gaps. Wow. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes we, we really underutilize information. It's true. You know, these days you could go online and find and find um, information about almost anything and it's then true. start learning that way. It's and true. if you want to know more about fish farming in Ghana or the fish value chain, fish farming and fish fish value chain in Ghana, I tell you, Google, we've we've done projects on that. Several of my colleagues published on that. Amazing. And and but you know, and most of these projects are paid for by some foreign government. Okay. The problem we have, one problem we have in Ghana is we don't really fund local research. So we are not necessarily always addressing local priorities because if somebody gives you money to do research, you're going to tell you what, what to do for. Do. Yes. If you think that research in the value chain is what should be done, and somebody comes in and says, well, no, this money is for developing fish feed. That's what you need to do. And yes. I had that headache when I was leading a USAID projects in the past you know, 10 years or so, 15 years. Um, up until 2017, 2018, this issue came up all the time because when I am on the ground, I see problems. Mm -hmm. I see problems that need immediate attention. And when when projects are funded, they are not always funded to solve those problems. Those, yes. Yes. And when people complain over here that, well, you know, this is really what we need and not that, then I say, well, it's because the government is you, not You didn't pay for it. it. You didn't pay for it, so you don't have that yeah. choice. But people are not utilized after all this, you know, something will be published and put over there, and it's in a, a file drawer no. or on the internet somewhere, and nobody cares about it anymore. It's like we do the project for project's sake. We don't necessarily utilize it. That is bad. Wow, wow. I, I would I would employ my, my audience that look go go ahead, go and, and Google these things. These are these are good. Mines. I, I think I think this is a good mine. Uh, go Google it, find the value chain, see where you can plug yourself in, and you may have a nice, nice, cute business out there. You you never know. Yes. You, you don't have to be in an office working for a bank. Yeah, uh, you have to now to tell you which areas in the fish value chain are. Uh, 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 do, bro, do, do. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a few. You know. Yes, yeah, tell uh, us a few. So, for example. Mm -hmm. Distribution of distribution of of fish. Okay, is is a problem. Wow, I've worked with farmers who work hard to produce fish. Then, when the fish are mature, mm. the fish are sitting in the pond. They are feeding them. At that time, fish have stopped growing. If you keep feeding them, you are just wasting feed. Money. The fish yes any bigger but they have to stay alive right yes so even if you are feeding them food for just maintenance that's stuff you could you could have it and get it out of your hands exactly so that you can get your profit the distribution has been such that the some of these people just have to wait on some market women to come um to the farm especially the, the smaller medium size to smaller farms which are far removed from other um big farms and the market women come and they say harvest the fish for us and then after the fish have been brought out of the pond and they are dead then that's when the, the women start their negotiations oh then your your leverage is all gone exactly they are not going to pay for the price you deserve because they know you can't put those fish back in the, in the pond and they underpay you and and you, you don't make much profit so you should have better distribution um Marketing and distribution strategies at the at the end of production, where you right. know who is going to come in and take it. Maybe they are taking it straight from there to go and clean them, process them, take them to cold stores. You know. Yes. And not this petty trading kind of negotiation of harvesting and and then negotiating prices. Um, there. <laughs> the, the second one I'm going to say is quite technical, but okay, that's okay. <laughs> 
So for fish to be put in, in a pond or, or, or a cage to be reared to a uh, table size, they begin as tiny, you know, fry. Okay. They are eggs, a hatch, the eggs are, are fed plankton, small, small things that make water green, yeah? Make right. natural water green, including apple to be bread and all those things. Okay, okay, that's what they call the algae. Yeah, yeah that's paradise and... Okay. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of unicellular algae that float in the, in the water that make the water really, really green. But those are food for fish. And then and then okay. animals that are that small, so Daphne and okay. Bobby and so forth, that feed on this algae. So a lot of the feeding of very small fish is this natural food. Okay. This natural food. And so those fish, tiny fish, they're just like Konkonti Ba, yeah? Mm, that little and tad they, <laughs> yeah. and then they, they grow they grow to a certain small size and at that time a lot of them would have died you know naturally okay. a lot of little fish die okay it, 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 it's thinned out to the ones that mm. are strong and survive through several different conditions right somebody has to take these small fish and raise them to the size of say my thumb you know me at which point they are really strong and rigorous and they can they can they are hardy they can be stuck in a pond or a cage with not too much risk of dying dying okay this that's called nursery that business is nursery in many countries there is a nursery component to the value chain where those who do the hatchery Hatching fish and creating large numbers of fry are not the same people that do the nursery. Hmm. Because you can specialize in some things, but if you try to do everything, at some point, part of it is going to be weak. It's true. And and one of the places where this this problem has arisen is so instead of stocking fish of the size that you feel are big enough now that. You know, they can take feed, you know what an artificial feed you give them, and then they will, most of them will survive. They are now taking all these tiny, tiny fish and stocking them. Mm. And in during transport and after they are stocked, a lot of them die. They are weak and they die. They, they are weak. They are um, still very delicate to care for, and they are not the stage that should be distributed. I see. And we did we did very careful economic analysis of how profitable it might be to just focus on raising fish to this fingerling size for stocking by just buying fry um, from from those who hatch fish and produce the tadpole size fish. And it is all out there, free information. Wow. But there are not many takers. Yes. Oh my goodness! This this is this is this is so sad. Yeah. Wow. This is this episode is a good my uh, bro. This is and that all the way to the government. You know, I consulted for the government in 2015. I produced a very important report because there, there was a different government then, but yeah. a report in the government's is it... offices is supposed to be there for forever and too. yes and and none of it of what we did and the government paid paid me for it so i would mm. have expected that, that it something to be utilized um utilized to the fullest none of it have been implemented so all these just sitting that gathering dust somewhere Wow, huge, huge! I I could say, prof, that uh, somebody is going to watch this and take action. I definitely. I <laughs> this is some somebody, some crazy person is going to say, "Wow, this is I need to get involved in this because it's like, you know, one of the things that you notice that in Ghana and other African countries, people just do copy, copy, you know, just buying and selling, you know, import, export business, like whatever. Somebody that's why everybody copies it is and but the import export business is why our city is racing down exactly exactly because we could we could you know grow our 
uh, fisheries industry so much that we could become a net, I mean, we could start exporting at least to some of our neighboring countries. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, Nigerians buy catfish from Ghana. If you can produce them in large enough quantities, Nigerians Nigerians are a very big catfish country. Ghanaians, the tilapia is a little bigger than catfish in terms of what we, we, we consume. We seek, yeah. But but we have neighbors who would love to have big love catfish it. produced and shipped to them, yeah? Oh, man. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, uh, Professor, you, 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 I mean, I'm so, I'm just learning. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, uh, I'm drinking from a fire hose here. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> so yeah. I think if we want to go to this stand, I think we'll go deep, deep, deep. Maybe we we'll have to do a, a 2.0, specifically in some of these, uh, 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 you know, go deeper into some of these things. But we, we, we can't have, do all of that. Let's, let's, let's yeah. explore as much yeah. as we can. But of course, I'm always at yes. the it's it's a it's a it's amazing. So so compare which African countries in your mind are doing very well comparatively. Well, at least in, they may not be on the level of China or on the level of other uh, places, but at least some of them compar comparatively they may be doing certain things right. Which one? Uh, which uh, Egypt. Which are some of those countries? Egypt, okay. Egypt. Hmm. Yeah. So you know, Egypt, of course, Egypt as an African country, uh, it sits a little bit closer to the Middle East, and sometimes people forget that Egypt is an African country. But mm -hmm. Egypt, uh, aquaculture in Egypt is there is a lot we could learn from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, Egypt's aquaculture production and growth over the years is comparable to many of the good aquaculture countries in Asia, yeah. And Nigeria. Nigeria is oh, coming, wow. quite, coming quite well. Um, and I think Ghana could be Ghana, Ghana could be in the top maybe five or six, but, you know, in the land of the blind, mm -hmm. one eye is a king, yeah? It's a king. <laughs> so it's just the fact that maybe we are producing near the top in Africa. When Africa is doing really this small compared to the rest of the world. World. Not rest on our laurels that you know we we are where we, we may be ranking a little high, but there is a great deficit of fish mm. production that we we have the land resources we have water. You know, Ghana has it's an amazing country in terms of um, natural resources and down there. Right. right. We have a, a long coastline, and then we have this massive inland water in the in the Volta Lake. And then all yes. the tributaries, and then at all these coastal waters, it's just massive terrain for mm. any kind of fish farming that a person could imagine. Mm. And we are underutilizing those. We are underutilizing them seriously. Mm. And I wow. think it's it's a blame that goes around. The government is part, 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 part of the problem. The people are part of the problem. Part of the problem. Because you can also take initiatives. You know, if the government doesn't support you financially, yes. but provides uh, the right business environment, environment you yes. have your own business, which I think Ghana's business environment is not that bad. I mean, we have yes. taxes. Sometimes the taxes get a little bit outrageous. Yes. Um, for a small business that's just trying to establish, I think some of the taxes are unnecessary. Yes. But there are also tax tax uh, tax incentives for incentives for certain types of businesses. Yes. Um. So I think we should not wait for the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have land, um, land that could be used for agricultural purposes, use them. Yes. You know. You don't have to travel overseas to go and work on somebody's farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, 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 wow. That that's a, that is so true. That is so true. That is so true. So so I, I think in, in talking about that, what in talking about land, um what typically would be the best place to start fish farming? So this is a question of location. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the location of the best land you have or the, the good price land you have 
yes it's not necessarily in a location where you have you're close enough to your target market okay or um the physical conditions on the land may not be the ideal physical conditions on the land so it's right. a multi-factor consideration mm. when you're looking at locating a fish farm somewhere and it also yes. depends on the type of fish farm you want to establish for example there okay. is a reason that many of the cage farms are on the water lake because you need a a, a slow moving water okay uh of natural water that mm. washes through the cage but not too strong of uh, of a flow to essentially um make it difficult for you to anchor your cage to a location you know okay okay and and care for it so yes. the water lake of course provides so many different conditions in many different parts of the of the margins of the lake for for fish farming but when you are farming in ponds ponds are generally the the best places to put pond farms are, of course it has to be close to water a yes. water source okay and and so they are usually low lying areas but not too too low lying like a river flood plain because there is one here in Anyangkwanta okay uh very close to where i'm sitting right now maybe just mm. 10 kilometers or so from, from okay from here where the farmer dug some really nice big ponds but then the Finn river it's just always flooding the farm you know oh. because the farm is too low line too low line yes mm -hmm. so you have to strike a balance between going low so that you can get water in the ponds and being high enough so you are not a victim of mm -hmm. rainy season flooding. Flooding yes every, every time it rains and all your fish just move with the flood and go into the river and go away mm -hmm. <laughs> but um you need you need land that is close to water then um the land the, the soil should be clay clay type soil okay from clay to loam when you have sand it drains too quickly and when okay. you put water in it, it drains just away. seeps away mm. yes and, you know filling a pond a large pond is a massive undertaking whether it that is, is uh, diverting some river, river. Or pumping water with a put a pump in a river or a well or something so you don't want it to be um so easy to lose the water in the pond so the locations are usually a balance of these so you need to care carefully consider water both the quality and the quantity of water around the soil types um, to get the right soil types and if if you do have to put it in a place where the soil is too porous because it other factors are favorable then you yes. may have to line the ponds with plastic top tops you know okay okay do, that. do line ponds it's not a cheap thing to do mm. to line ponds. But in some places that's the only option they have because they don't have all the great soil that's perfect for for fish ponds but they they still do fish ponds i've been to many places in kenya where they have only line ponds and they are doing their fish farming yeah, well farming. Okay. In Ghana, many places in the south, in the mainland, you don't need to line a pond anywhere. Wow. And you will have you have the perfect soil for fish farming in many places. Even Amazing. abandoned mine pits have been used at the, oh, at the people for fish farming. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what that's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, some, of them are, some of them are too deep, and some of them okay. have arsenic and those things okay yes yeah, those chemicals yeah pollutes water so you really have to have a careful check of the water so you don't just bring us fish with full of arsenic arsenic yes that's that's dangerous those are carcinogenic right yes okay. and mercury the mercury too oh wow, wow, wow. Yeah, i think mercury may not be carcinogenic but it's certainly teratogenic yeah you mm. give it to pregnant women then they are giving birth to babies with different with one ones yeah one hand and all those things wow wow so so i think no that, that that last place i would like to look at is um i noticed there was uh i i drove around Tema some time back and uh, i saw this fish feed company it's a um, israeli company and i said so i was just asking myself why are 
foreign companies coming here to set up fish feed. Can't we do our own thing? You, you know, I, I, I said, wow. So, so how, how I think that industry too should be, that subset or that value chain should be big as well. So how are we doing uh, when it comes to fish feed kind of production? How, how difficult it is to do that locally? Uh, so a fish feed is a, a very central consideration in the growing of any uh, fish farming industry in a country. It has to be reliable. It has to be in large quantities. Okay. And there, there are different characteristics of feed that make them suitable for different kinds of farming. And in particular, in our in our context, feeds that float in a pond when when you put them in a pond or a cage are much more desirable than than feed that sink. Okay. And the technology to produce floating feed is not like it's a technology that is unknown. It's extruded. You know, just yeah. like they produce cherries and such, and it, it oh yes, air is pumped into them and they it. float. <laughs> so, um, a lot of farmers actually know how to produce feed. The ingredients can be expensive because mm. you know they, they include fish meal, and that's oh, a conversation wow. we can have at another time. Is you know, if okay. you're going to use fish meal to produce fish. Better be a much cheaper fish that you're using to produce a more expensive fish. Otherwise, it's a waste. <laughs> it's a waste. Yeah. But um, there are substitutes for fish meal, such as soy, soy bean. But also soybean, we also compete with fish. People eat soybean. Yes. Chicken eat soybean. All those livestock. So it's not all available for fish. Hmm. But you can substitute some. So a lot of other local sources of protein in particular uh, granite husk, um, things like pito, um, whatever is left over after the pito is extracted, all oh, sort wow. of things have been explored as additional possible sources of protein for fish. It's fish, wow. you know, wow. it's, it's animals, animal feed. You, you, you don't have to have the first cut, highest quality source of the feed for the animal. If it is agro waste from another another industry, rice bran, etc. Mm -hmm. Chances mm -hmm. are that there is a quality a value in it for um for fish as well. So a lot of farmers have learned to produce feed from using these ingredients. They we, we run courses where we teach them how to produce these. Okay. The problem is they often complain that they don't have they don't have the funding to buy the extruder to okay. make the food float, for example. Okay. Okay. And and to me, that's the problem that farmers have complained about for way too long. And mm. if that's really the main limit limiting factor, if the government is looking to strategically invest in fish farming, this is something the government could subsidize or or give farmers loan to acquire this machine Fine. and pay it back yes. over a period of time. Yes. So yes. um that's at a farmer level, but as, as a company, you know, setting up in Ghana, it, it's a free market. Hmm. Uh, if a Ghanaian will not set up a feed production facility and an Israeli would like to set up one, we shouldn't stop them, right? That's right. So um, the, the Israeli company that you're talking about, Ranan Fish Feed, um, yes, that's 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 them. I know I know the the owners very well. Ranan okay. himself, I've met. I've also <laughs> uh, the marketing director of Ranan Fish Feed is Jack Magni. He's in Ghana most of the time. He's from Virgil. I've, wow. I've so many different interactions with him. I visit the Pram Pram facility when yes, I'm yes. Grossing. Um, they came in and made some kind of agreement with the government to produce the feed for the local market and also um export to some of the west african sub regions mm -hmm. and i understand at some point the they were selling more feed to other countries around here than ghana not because they didn't want to sell to ghana ghanaians also like to import things mm -hmm. you know after another company has been given tax incentives to set up a company in ghana they also have to make profit and there's all yes. kinds of you know back and forth that has to go on to make sure that the feed are being produced at the best quality and at the right prices 
yes. organizing farmers. But you can't prevent them from also exporting and doing everything they can to make sure they stay in business, right? Yes, yes. Especially when the government itself was also importing feed from Brazil and from here and from there. Uh, so I, I spoke with the minister then of the previous government and she was all about, well, we're going to go import feed from from Brazil because this, this company has not done its uh, its part in the agreement we had with them. And I'm just going to, and I'm saying- but That's going to crash your city. Why don't you just set up another company? Yes. Why are you going to import feed from Brazil? You know, the politics of all this also sometimes is just- Yes. So, so they get competition from imports, sometimes unnecessary imports. Um, I understand that other companies were prospecting to come and set up. Competition is a good thing too. It's a good you know, thing, Nobody's yes. saying that yes. Ranan should not have competitors. But I wish that other local investors and the government would have supported local investors to set up more feed companies so that there will be competition. Yes. Yeah. But there are a lot of different feed companies in the country uh, with products in the country. I think about six or eight of them the last time I looked, and that was 20, maybe 2016, 2015 ish. So right right yeah. now, it, it could, could be, be more. 10 more. Okay. They import feed from China, they import feed from everywhere. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Wow, wow, wow. Bro, this this is this has been uh, this is a this is a mini university class for me. I, I've I've really enjoyed this session. So, <laughs> so so now let's go to let's go to how you started. Prof, you, you grew up in Nobuasi, right? The the the, the mining the mine the gold mining center of Ghana. And uh yes, sir. yes and, and, and and did you always wanted to be be doing this is this a passion of yours or you just accidentally found yourself into into this line uh this line honest, of career to be honest i ended up where i am largely by fates of fates of uh nature and our education system wow um, but but i know i ended up in the right place in the right place because you are you are very knowledgeable and super passionate about your field Yes. So, you know, when I, I don't know how much you want me to tell you, but I'll tell you um, <laughs> if I'm going on and on in unnecessary detail, let me know. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I started out there in this, um, Obwase is, has always been a mining town, very um, little else goes on apart from AGA, it used to be a Shandigo mm -hmm. Fields company, full yes. of, you know, Mining uh, big vehicles and dust, uh, gray dust everywhere. Uh, mm. If a kid is not in school, they are probably exploring gold mining of sorts, like sweep the road uh, and then and then go and check if there is gold in the dust. Yeah, there's gold in there. Gold in there. <laughs> yeah, and there were people who would buy if you went to sweep, just sweep gravel on the on on surface to road. They would buy it by the basket because they know how to find gold in it. So we were just really just exploring Obuasi as a town and running around and um, using a lot of our free time as a kid to just understand what's around us. And in the, in the process of doing that, I, I got myself really exposed to a lot of things, mm. um, both natural and good things and not so good things like yes. I swam. I swam in mine tailwaters, you know. Oh wow! Some of those ponds created by the mining companies it kills that kids. Dangerous. All yeah, that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, you. I mean, when you dip yourself in it and you come out, you are completely white, like you are gray. And we would go wander and wander and wander, and you end up in a place where there is no adult to say, "Don't do this," and you just jump in and you make yourself swim and. It, it gets in your mouth and your body. If actually, I tell my friends in the US, um, if mercury kills, I would, you would have, have died. been a long time ago. <laughs> so I didn't have to to bear children. And if I had mercury contamination in my body, I think yeah, I would have caused problems. It didn't show up in my in my case. <laughs> yes. So um, that part, just exploring the mind, 
Yes. Just walking on very large bare areas where there is no trees. They just doing surface mining and ripping the land surface. And, um, that's one one destruction of nature that I would later come to realize that natural resources management has a lot to say about that. You know. Yes. And then um, on the nature side, I I really explored animals. Okay. That's why I did a lot of fishing with my dad. Would just my dad was a teacher. My mom's a teacher as well. Oh but wow! My mom liked to farm wherever we lived. She had a garden somewhere, not too far away, or even mm -hmm. what you call a farm, another maybe one or two kilometers away. She just liked to farm, and my dad, he went fishing with his uh, his cousin, and they would go to um, a river. And I would follow them and, and they would make their own tackle, you know, buy the hook, buy the pieces and set it up and, and then they, they get some fish. Yes. And when they are not there, I would gather my friends and we'll buy this tackle and uh, pieces and then go and do the same. So <laughs> I, was, I was exposing myself then to fish early without knowing that I would. Yeah, you'll be there. On my profession. I also mm -hmm. trap birds trap okay. birds i you know i made bird cages um i built tin can tin can um cars and all those things oh okay um, like You're a typical to, typical countryside boy exactly, exactly. <laughs> I made, made wagons with bow rays you know you buy those um rollers yeah or yeah. you find them in a a wasteland where AGC, the Ashanti Gophers Company dumps. Yes. Them. Then yes. you take those rollers and you put them on wood and you build these wagons. You make it a scooter or a wagon. I built yeah. those things. I was those things. always building something. <laughs> and, so, 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 what did you do in uh, secondary school? Oh, oh, so, uh, you know, because uh -huh. of this, all this, my dad at some point said, you know, I was a tinker and he said, I'll take you to a, a, a the technical school because you have okay. technical te you seem to like technical things yes and so um he actually took me uh um, when i was in second second year of um middle school mm -hmm. um i took a common entrance examination okay. which then was how we transitioned go to, to senior school. yes mm -hmm. and i i got a good grade and i went to obwasi sec tech so Obwasi okay Secretary, yes you know was one yes. of the that was the best, yes. Technical schools, yeah. Yes, and I started amazing. A day student for one year, uh -huh. um, so I I walked quite a distance from home to school daily. Yeah, wow. And then uh, the second was your was your was your mom and dad teaching there, or they were teaching? No, they, they they were uh, pub, uh, what do you call public school teachers. Public school teachers, yes. So they okay. were. My dad was in the district education office, and my mom okay. was a nursery, a nursery teacher. You, you um, know, bro. One of the things I noticed that teachers' kids always do well. It's it's a mystery. I think so, and I mean maybe that's the fringe benefit we get. I think so too. Generally, don't have much. They don't get money. Enough money. money. Yes. Uh, you know, I wouldn't call us poor at all, but we were not. Uh, rich, you're not rich yeah. by any means. Maybe yes. you, were, you were lower middle income people. Yes. And I, I come, I come from a very large family of eight kids. And wow. Uh, so there is just barely enough to go around, and everybody <laughs> has to has to just make best the best use of what they get. You know. Wow. So so, so um, from what you find yourself at tech. Yeah? Or crime and criminal university or science tech. Yeah, so at, at tech, tech, you know, I actually did the O level there. Okay. Um, and then uh, at the A level, uh, it turned out that I didn't really have much of um, a choice. I had to do the A level also at at Sec Tech. Was okay. Um, at that time, the technical school that I went to was not the technical school. Uh, it wasn't the career for me anymore because it, okay. it, it, it was a dead ender. They had technical drawing mm -hmm. was my favorite subject, but okay, it didn't really have the correct combination of classes for you to go on and do something with it. You know. Yes. Like if you're doing technical drawing, you have to do math. Yes. You have to do math. You have to combine those to go into engineering or architecture or something. Yes. Um, which is my hobby right now is landscaping, and I know. That oh wow! Comes way back from there. I. If you draw a line and it's not straight, I don't need a ruler to tell you this is not a straight line. Amazing. 
I really like construction. So wow. um, I, I did the O and A level there. Mm-hmm. And then um, I did my national service at New York Secondary School, where I taught high school. Okay. And prior to that, though, something that you might find interesting is I worked. I worked quite a lot as, as a kid, you know. In my explorations, I also liked to work. Mm-hmm. So I started as a as a uh, shoe shine boy, maybe <laughs> we call it a shoemaker, but maybe better term is the shoe mender. Um, yeah, shoe mender. From, from about age ten, and I'd walk maybe four or five kilometers to nearby villages and mend shoes for people and. To go to the I Pito mean, area and people take off their shoes and throw them at you and you wow. shine their shoes for them when they are drinking. I did all that for seven years. I went to secondary seven school. Seven years? Form four before I stopped being a shoe shine boy. And wow, so, so shoe shine boy to Virginia Tech professor. Yeah, I was a shoe shine boy. And then when I finished O level, the time between O level and A level, I went to be a vulcanizer. I work with a vulcanizing um <laughs> because I have an in-law who was a vulcanizer and I just took on the the job for the whole time I was waiting for my O level results. So now wow. I know how to take off tires and to fix, fix your tires. tires. Put them back in my car, yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, but I also loved teaching. You know, oh. so my service was all teaching. I I thought I'd new at secondary school. And at that time I had decisions to make. I uh, I, hmm. I had Grades, I would call them mediocre, you know. My grades okay. were passes, but not the the excellent grades I Stella, was to yeah. go to the university mm-hmm. to maybe something that I really thought I, I wanted to do. So mm-hmm. as the time came, I applied for several courses at the university. And then I received admission for natural resources management and biological sciences. Mm-hmm. Then so I course. Yeah, I sat back and uh started second guessing whether I wanted to go to the university then or or do what they call remedia and uh, okay try to get into pharmacy or medicine which is what okay. everybody knew everybody, everybody, yes. nobody ever gave us career <laughs> counseling to let you know that maybe there is oh. more to more to life than that than those <laughs> so um at that time luckily for me there was one national service um guy from tech who was his his major was physics okay and he came in and 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 said you know um you need not waste time here mm. we have been offered some courses go and take one of these courses and move on yes and then he cited example of the then vc amonu neza and said amonu yes. neza his major is chemistry he's the vice chancellor of the university of the university is examples true of people who have done we used to call them raw courses, and we thought those were the worst thing to happen to you is if you got a raw course, you know. Right, I would it, is, learn, it is the best. I'll later it is. Is that that's the hard courses. That's the hard course. <laughs> it's yeah. true. So yeah, that's how I started at, at KNUSD. Um, I went on and took on natural resources. I was still learning what it was all about when I got in. Yes. Um, but but that is also where I started to shine. Yes. My education had been through schools that didn't have a lot of resources. Resources, but yes, it's true. Had had, OSEC Tech had had some good days, but when we were there, there it was wasn't. years where the whole batch of students who were finishing would fail, you know? Oh. Maybe one or two people will pass, pass yeah. good enough to go to A level, but you would have a class of 150 to 200 students. And then you have just one or two people that that have good enough. Do well. to go to. Yes, that's how this month the statistics work. Yes. And so the way I learned is we didn't have a lot of great teachers. Two te- yes, and resources, labs, and things. Read. I learned to read a lot. I read. Yes. Like when I lay my hands on a textbook, I read all of it. Mm, wow. Of course, at that time, reading a textbook is good it's learning, good. but it is not. For the exam, you know, no, and we were we were being trained for an exam. Everything depends on that final exam, as you know. We didn't yes. even have continuous assessment. It's true. Everything was whether you, what that two weeks set aside at the end of your five years in school or or two years in A level, whether you pass those exams. So, 
I think I educated myself a lot in things that were irrelevant for Waik exams. <laughs> but those all came to fruition when I went to the university. Oh. Because I was broadly learning, but nobody cared that I was learning. Yes. But at the university, your teachers are the examiners. They are. And <laughs> if you are capable of just extending what your teacher is teaching you and reading well and and making yourself you know, a contender there, there is no obstacle. It's not like the secondary school. Wow. So I immediately realized at tech that I was way, way better than- You I thought you were. <laughs> so right from the first semester, I got a first class uh, GPA. And you know, I, I'm, 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 I was in a class of 60 students and I am the only one who finished with a first class degree. Oh, wow, Prof. Congratulations. To gloat. Thank you. Mm. So the university treated me well. Mm. Or maybe I treated myself well at the university. The system... Wow. So, so, yeah, so, so you would become a teaching assistant then with the first class? Yeah, I was. And, uh, and that okay. wasn't necessarily a good thing, actually. Then, oh, really? It, it did seem like if you're a teaching assistant, then you're likely to you maybe receive postgraduate scholarships and you travel. Yes. So that was yes. kind of problem. I'm telling them. Uh -huh. it, was, it was clear that that opportunity was not there for us when we were teaching assistants, me and my, my classmates. Oh, um, wow. So I, I did the teaching assistantship for one year. And then, unfortunately, whenever I went out there to try to find a job, they would look at my transcript and, and tell me, you're going to go back to school. We were looking Definitely. for somebody, somebody who will last over here. So I actually <laughs> had more difficulty getting a job. A job. Because of my grades. And the university was simply not finding any opportunities for me. I was stuck. Uh, in that was God's way of telling you that your, your lane is not in uh, industry yet, but exactly. academia. I think so. <laughs> yeah. So, so how did you find yourself in Purdue then? So... Um, I actually started my education in the United States at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, you know. Okay. I spent several years, well, two years at KNUS, one year as a teaching assistant. The following year, I enrolled in a master's, master's in aquaculture there. Okay. Um, and I, I was not getting a lot of support, mm -hmm. I have to say, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was just another number there. Yes. Um, so I applied for all sort of scholarships mm -hmm. in all sort of places. Sometimes did way more paperwork than necessary to apply mm -hmm. for a scholarship. Like I applied for the Mobusho scholarship to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. I had to go and do chest X-ray and a oh, my and goodness. Lab and all those things before you submit the application. Oh, you oh, no. Later that, yeah, your grades are good, but there are too many applications. Oh, no. Why did I have to go through uh, that? Yeah, radiation. Uh, yeah, unnecessary radiation exposure. Or applying. But that's the kind of struggle, you know. We, so um, one day, one of my professors forwarded to me uh, an assistantship um, ad that was out there in at the, uh, there is a, one of the international center for uh, agroforestry is, is in Kenya. Okay. And they they had received this ad for a master's in aquaculture and fisheries from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And this one was not like, here, it's a package. We are buying yes. your ticket. Everything is ready. Bring somebody. Wow. You know, wow. if that's the kind of scholarship it was, you yes. have seen it. <laughs> so this was like, okay, apply and see what happens. And by that time, I had taken the GRE and TOEFL. I was just okay. waiting for something that that to come could, could apply to. And so mm. I applied. I got good references from my professors. That's one mm. thing that I will remember them for. They were not mm. giving me any money, working for them a lot. But, but when miss... it came to reference, they wrote me very good reference. Oh, that's good. So I went to Pine Bluff. I did a, a two-year master's really quick. Um, and then went to Purdue for a PhD. But wow. that time I realized that the sky was my limit. 
Because <laughs> by the time I finished my master's, I had two offers of PhD, very good offers of PhD. Amazing. I had a professor begging me to come to Clemson University oh. because of the credentials I submitted in my application. But then Purdue, the professor at Purdue was really something. Yeah, yeah, he understood competition and he had he had had, a, had had a PhD student from Ghana that he really oh, oh wow so he here. So he invited me to visit Purdue to see uh, Purdue for myself, show me things and I'll make a very good offer so I could bring my you wife. Could, oh that's even better. He knows how to sweet, sweeten the pot. <laughs> <laughs> I like people like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this this story is is unique. Is unique. Wow, this is, I, and I know that at this time there are students who who are looking for, uh, up to you to get opportunity to enter into some of the programs at Virginia Tech as well. Well, I've trained, I've trained many. In fact, ah, you I've, see. Had, Trained three masters and three PhD students from um, from KNUST. Wow! Um, yeah, because of all the projects we were working with them over here, I'll just come in personally, interview them, yes. identify them. Sometimes I send some of them to my colleagues in other universities too. Okay. And I really, um, it was one of my missions. I knew how frustrating it was to just it was. university and uh, be hiring to go overseas and nobody really cared. And so, yeah, I have, wow. one of my students was actually, is actually a lecturer at KNUSD, <laughs> and, uh, a very high level person in the FAO in Rome. Wow. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, out there. You must be a proud professor now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, my U.S. trained students. I have a lot of, of course, a much much larger proportion of my students are yes, a native and in Americans. US. Yes, they are also doing well. I have professors. I have state biologists and such people who have stories to tell about me, but they clearly got some good education. <laughs> uh, uh, this is amazing. This is what I would say. This is this is what. Uh, uh, you know, God can do take a, a, a shoe shine boy and and transpose him and and just change his life. Hey, I know it wasn't easy. It's the process has been excruciatingly painful, but it's worth every minute of it. it no, it taught it, me. Some, it taught me quite a lot of skills. You know. Yes. Endurance. Huh. My dad wasn't fully on board when I initially proposed to be a shoe shine boy. It wasn't <laughs> that he. Uh, I thought that's something that kids who are not supervised do. Yes, they do. And, and, and so he he initially resisted, but I I don't know. I don't even remember why I was so intent on becoming a shushan. But I think there was a boy who lived near us who was a shushan boy, and he had this box, and he would uh, hang it over here and walk to the village. And his his mom lived in the next village from Obwasi and, and so he he went there daily and I felt like man this is something I can do. I could do easy peasy. <laughs> so one day I said I'm going to be a Shishan boy and my dad wasn't on board but my mom somehow bought him and then they got me a box and we bought my oh. brush and my polish. Yes hammer, some nail <laughs> and a shoe pannier and off we, off I went <laughs> And I was only 10, you know, at that time I was only 10. Uh, so my dad, one of his concerns was, you know, you can't walk in these lonely back rooms. Yeah, bushes, and, yes. In this village and all that. But it was safe, you know. That's one thing that I like about Ghana is kids safe. are safe. Yeah, kids relatively. Safe, generally. I mean, yes, there, but, are, there are some new trends that are bad. And, and, yes, but, but, but generally. You know. A grown up would see me and say, hey, Why are you all by yourself here? Be careful, okay? And I'm here. <laughs> so I learned Amazing. independently managing my own business, right? Yes, yes, yes. Which I'm boy. I made money. <laughs> yes. My mom even That's... made me a money box. Well, oh. I, money box. So wow. I, come back, I put some money in the box and I kept <laughs> putting money in the box. Look at you and now. I can't call it piggy bank. Piggy bank, yes. 
And you, you, they, they, do, they do lemonade stands and then uh, they, the money they get, they put it in piggy banks. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, though, you are you're surprised how much money you have put in the piggy bank, you know? Amazing, amazing. And whenever you open the box, yes, it was a lot of money. Yes. And that endurance, maturity that I learned from being a business manager of, of sorts. At yes. Uh, it's been my drive, I think. It's been my amazing. Drive. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So, well, finally, I think on this same tangent, you know, if you were to give uh, counsel or advice, share some of the nuggets that you picked along the way uh, in terms of advising our young people, um, what, what would what would they be? Because you have such a massive breadth of of experience. I mean, from the village to everywhere, it's like from each end of the spectrum, you've been there. <laughs> so, sharing some of the, if somebody wants to take some of the steps that you took, uh, especially those who are looking in the field of academia, what are some of the nuggets that you can share with them for them to get there maybe faster? I would say, I'd say you know you learn some skill, learn mm -hmm. to work with your hands mm -hmm. early. Okay. Doesn't matter how unrelated it is to your ultimate profession. Okay. Learn, learn to work with your hands and do so early. Mm. And, and then whenever, whatever you find your, your hands on, do it with your might. Good. You know, these are two pieces of advice because, you know, and, and both of them apply to my own experience as I've shared, you know? Yes. I learned so many things. I learned so many things as a kid. Mm. I, I built things. Maybe not not the, the highest quality thing I built, you know, but I built things. Yes. I built bed cages, I made raffia hats, I made uh, tin can cars, I made worries. Everything. I just wouldn't sit idle. It wasn't possible okay. for me to sit idle. Went fishing with my friends, made my own tackle. Hmm. When I was doing all those things, I had, you know, I had education in the background. I was going to school. I yes. never saw stopped school to work. Mm. And I think Africans have allowed the world to label working by school age children as child labor <laughs> to the point where it is it is harming us. It's true. So you know I I'm in America. I see yes. kids Kids, thirteen year olds working on their parents' farms. Yes, they do. The tractor, lawn mowing lawns, doing lemonade stand or whatever, and they, they have they, all that work ethic. Yes, they even work uh, on their parents. If they, 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 those who are entrepreneurial, they even work on their social media for them for marketing. Exactly. And they get paid. I mean, if yes. my, my kid mows my lawn, I pay them. They do that. But yes. in Africa, you know, somebody comes here. Get a photo of a kid on the farm. One day in my church, I had to address them and say, "This is, this is bogus." They were talking yes. about, they were talking about um, African cocoa farms and how the children of Africa are exploited by cocoa farmers, and therefore they were doing this campaign to boycott West African cocoa. Hmm. And I, so I looked at the whole story. And of course, if you're looking for the picture of a child on a cocoa farm, you will find many. You find many. The same yes. thing if you're looking for a picture of a child on a fishing boat, you'll find you some. You'll find many. Yes. And there, there's no question that some children are exploited, that some children are probably made to do dangerous things. But the overall narrative that children working is child labor, we've bought into it beyond. Um, Beyond sense, it's logical and good for mm -hmm. for our children, and so children yeah. don't work these days. It's they true. go all the way to university and finish a university degree before they Starting ever to work. start to work. And mm. how would you expect them to know work ethic? They it's see true. movies, they see people working, and they imagine that that's it. When you finish university. There will be car and there will be office and there will be suit and you will go and work. You know, 
there is no training, hands-on practical training for children before they get to university. So me, I make my children work. My daughter Good. works at a restaurant. My son works yeah. uh, at the grocery store. And yes. even they don't need the money. Mm-hmm. That is how they know what work is before the they go to university. Work. Yes. So, um, and I, I don't think it's just a problem of Ghana now. I mean, when I was mm-hmm. in secondary school, I guess our secondary school career was long enough that there was there were ways that kids could be engaged in work during long vacations and such, and also be um, be in school. And these days, um, they, 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 it's like a very short, compressed program, shorter than needs to be, in my opinion. Yeah. And the excuse is that they don't have enough time, so they don't work. Hmm. And then if the kids just go home for money. Whenever they need money, it's their parents, you know. And and then and then they, they are so entitled. They go to the university. Before when I was when I was going to the university, your parents would not follow you to the university. Never. They would laugh at you when you if you landed at the university with, with your parents. parents. Yeah. You are mature by the time you went to the university. These days, you know, they they are like they are treated like secondary Babies. kids. Yes. The university. So when 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 do they mature? Are they supposed to be maturing while they are going to the university? Hmm. They they feel entitled. They feel like they are still children. Yes. And they they feel like somebody should employ them and offer them a lot of great working conditions. <laughs> and that, that thing is out there as soon as they finish their degree. Yeah. And the second piece of advice is whatever your your hands find doing, doing it, do it with that. Well. Okay, so you know, I of course, like many children of our of, of our time, I also toyed with the idea of going to pharmacy school, going to medical school, and so forth, because that seemed like the only way you could call it success if you yes. went to secondary school and you um you you went to the university to do medicine. But you know, the path I found myself on, I just applied myself. Yes. When I started the university, I didn't look back. Mm. Once I knew what I was doing and the natural resources and what it entails, I just kept chicken, chipping it away. That's right. And there is a lot there for people to do to, to manage our resources. Yes. And what we need is good education for people to manage their resources well. Right. The fact that we are not necessarily managing our resources well, the fact that we are not producing enough fish and we are destroying our forest, Mm-hmm. And our wildlife is all gone. You go to the north, you go to Mole National Park, and you have to spend some time looking for elephants. Mm-hmm. When you go to East Africa, you sit there, and the elephants come to you. Come to you. The animals are all over the place. Here, we've eaten all of them, and the field oh, that I left, you know, it's very hard to find them. Even the zoo is, I don't know if it's still there. So, if we are training that many natural resources management professionals, and things are this this small. You need to do more work. The students need to apply themselves more. The, the, the lecturers need to teach and give a mindset of both patriotism, entrepreneurship. And yes, some of us will work for the government, but that's not the only way you will be employed. Yes. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, Prof, this is this is fascinating. This this is mind opening, uh, and I, I don't even know the adjectives anymore. It's it's been incredible. We are super 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 excited and 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 privileged that you spent this time and shared these insights. I, this one episode, I'm just going to probably listen to it myself like three or four times to to really. <laughs> questions and things this is, is amazing it's, it's amazing so so you 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 eventually have to go back right to to virginia you, you're not gonna yeah spend so too much i'm time. here on the u.s um for for right scholar program yes i'm a representative of the u.s government in ghana right now right um the fulbright program is a cultural um it's sort of a, both culture and an aid program. The, the government, U.S. government, is putting some of its academic at the disposal of other countries. Oh, that's to good. Bring some of our knowledge to other countries, but also to establish friendships between us and the United States. 
Yes. So I'm just um, lucky that I happen to have been posted to a country where I have uh, your roots. Back <laughs> for it, and and they were gracious enough to let me come to Ghana. Oh. Um, so I have a limited time to to do what I'm here for, and and I'm yes. my my program ends in the middle of October. Okay. Okay. Wow. Then 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 Ghana must utilize your your knowledge and services. Uh, to the fullest before you you go, <laughs> Prof. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I, I believe your life is nothing but a blessing and an inspiration to us. We we really appreciate you. We really appreciate your time, and we appreciate your knowledge. God bless you, sir. Thank, thank you, you thank so you very much. much for hosting. Me. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you too.